uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and, and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see, vision, shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs in the earth below blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many of you uh, may be thinking the same question that those in the crowd ask themselves. Namely, what does this actually mean? Some of you may even be tempted to think that this whole story is just absolutely ridiculous and dismiss it sort of like those in the crowd who thought that they were witnessing an inebriated hangover rather than a transformational moment uh, of God's relationship with humanity. I must admit that I have struggled mightily with this text as I've prepared to speak to you today. Pentecost is an abundantly important holiday for the church and for our lives as Christians, but it is also an extremely odd liturgical holiday. At least with Christmas, we have something pretty straightforward, right? A baby is born, and we celebrate. We eat together, we worship, we exchange gifts, we relax with our families and friends. Or with Easter, a death occurs, and we unite our voices in joy and praise to celebrate a resurrection from that death that is our hope as Christians. But Pentecost is sort of weird. The scene presented to us in our story for this morning seems like it would be better suited for an epic sci-fi movie rather than in, for scripture. It is a strange and supernatural story that could be interpreted many different ways, which brings about a feeling of complexity and confusion. And if I feel that way now, reading this story almost 2,000 years later, how confusing would it have been to be present there, to be a part of the story and to actually experience what happened firsthand? I could just imagine what the newspaper headlines reporting on the event would say. From the AP, a Pentecost party wrecked by a strange wind event. This is a developing story. Or in the New York Times, 120 people displaced by strange weather phenomenon, meteorologists weigh in. 
or from the new sentinel. Home was damaged by a twister that was heard but not seen. Or what about the National Enquirer? Tongues of fire? Exclamation point. Real? Or did Houdini come back from the dead? Or the Washington Post. Amazing story. Woman learns German, Spanish, and Portuguese in a matter of minutes. <laughs> Miracle? Or a Rosetta Stone cover-up? You be the judge. The experience of the Holy Spirit's arrival would, would have definitely made an impact, I think, on those present. And there would have been some fascinating stories that would have come out of the experience. But there is something deeper here than just how crazy the story is. And because it actually happened, and because it is before us this morning, it begs the question that is explicit in our text. What does this mean? What did this event mean for those who directly experienced the power of the Holy Spirit for the first time? Well, for those present at that first moment of Pentecost, it was the fulfillment of a promise given by Christ before he ascended to heaven. In Acts 1, just prior to our story for this morning, Jesus says to his disciples, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in, Ju in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The arrival of the Holy Spirit is first and foremost the fulfillment of a promise from Christ to his followers. It was the promise that a spirit would come to the earth to fill the void. Of, his, of Jesus Christ's presence after his ascension. Christ says that the Spirit will give his followers power so that they may be witnesses of him in their neighborhoods, in their cities, the regions, into the whole world. The coming of the Holy Spirit brings with it a power that emboldens Christ's followers with a desire to spread the good news of his teaching and of his life and of his death and of his resurrection. But how might this power be spoken or utilized? How should one bear witness to the good news? Well, Peter gives us a hint when he quotes the prophet Joel by saying, In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Peter is reminding those gathered around him who are hearing him and who are questioning the legitimacy of what they just experienced, as well as those who are trying to understand it, that this great arrival is connected to a vision that was cast in the past by the prophet Joel. Where a spirit will be given to God's own and that power will come from this spirit that can build bridges of understanding between peoples. And this spirit will inspire those across generations and genders and social classes and ethnicities and even cultures to dream dreams about God and God's will. And to see prophetic visions of what God's power could be here on earth. Peter reminds those around him that the Spirit of God was promised to Christ's followers and that this Holy Spirit has the power to equip all of God's people to share the good news with the whole world. By highlighting Joel's words here, Peter also reminds his hearers that God's high, God highly values the Spirit-inspired visions and dreams of all of humanity. To speak about God's deeds of power, age doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. Background, culture, social class doesn't matter. For Peter then, the Holy Spirit makes real a vision of the future that makes the proclamation of the good news abundantly inclusive rather than limited to a particular societal or cultural group. With the arrival of the Holy Spirit, God demands something bigger and something bolder. 
Namely, that the good news of Jesus Christ and God's power in Christ be made known to all and that the power and authority to proclaim such things is not bounded to the, the, to the structures of this world, but resides with God alone. But what does this experience mean for us, for you and I here now? We have considered what the experience would have been like for those who were there, and even for Peter, but what about for our 21st century world? What does this story have to do with us hearing about it nearly 2,000 years after it occurred and celebrating it on this Pentecost Sunday? Well, I think God is inviting all of us to embrace the power of the Holy Spirit and to use it. We know that its power is a gift for all of us and that it is here to equip our, our witness in the world. But I want to invite you to consider what visions about God that you have on your own heart. How have you dreamed about living into Christ's teachings and following his example? How does the all-inclusive and unconditional love of God move you? Have you dreamed about being a peacemaker in our world? Or a good Samaritan? What enemies could you love into submission? Who could you stop judging? What could it look like if, all, uh, if we all fed someone around us in both body and in spirit? When have you felt the nudge or a nudge to help someone else who was oppressed or outcast? Or to proclaim the power of God's mercies to someone that you work with or your family? These are just a few of the questions that we have all had on our hearts at one time or another. And to seek to answer them is to be inspired to connect to the power of the Holy Spirit. This Spirit finally invites all of us to embody Christ's teachings for the world to proclaim the good news with truth and power and to strive to make the love of God rule in our hearts so that it guides our actions. The Holy Spirit bids each of us to embrace a vision that makes genuine kindness and mercy our aim in life so that healing in hearts, in the hearts of all people, can occur. And God's Spirit is what calls us to strive for justice, peace, and compassion in our communities rather than wealth, status, or even popularity. As we strive to do these things more and more, we will begin to manifest the dream that God has for all of humanity. It is Christ's spirit-filled vision for the world that we must cling to and rely upon and boldly proclaim to all around us. The time for this is now. And the Holy Spirit is calling upon each of you in your own way to cast a vision for others of God's powerful deeds in Christ. Are you going to keep the Spirit waiting? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.